Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak here today. Um, I want to start off with some general comments about um, genomics of trees. Looking at the uh, acreage figures on this slide of um, land use in the UK, you might expect that roughly 50% of the effort that we've put into breeding arable crops, we've also put into breeding trees. But of course, as we all know, that isn't the case. And I think that's quite exciting and that it means that there could be considerable untapped potential in tree breeding, especially in the era of genomics, um, to actually see improvements in forestry in the UK. So if we look at the chart of um, UK cereal yields over the last 60 or so years, as we all know, they've risen very dramatically. And the yields of wood from our woodland have also risen, but not half as dramatically as the yields of arable crops. And that, of course, is partly because we haven't been breeding uh, trees in the same way as we've been breeding crops. And there are many practical reasons for why that's the case, and political ones as well. But the need for increased productivity in our woodlands is uh, exemplified by the lower chart on this slide, and that is the UK imports of wood pellets and this is just since 2009. Um, due to a, sh a shift towards um, using biomass for electrical uh, production, uh, we are now importing thousands of tonnes of uh, wood pellets from North America. And we, we simply don't have the capacity here in the UK to provide all of the uh, wood that we need in, in this context and in many other contexts. That also applies in the context of timber. <coughs> So we really need to improve the productivity of our woodlands if, we, if we're going to keep up with the demand that we have. And of course, we've tended to let trees get on with it with regards to pests and pathogens, and they've generally done okay. But now, because we're moving live plants all over the globe in trade, in horticulture and forestry, uh, we have an influx of pests and pathogens. And for example, in the ash tree, we're all aware of ash dieback, which entered the UK reasonably recently after spreading through Europe very rapidly. And in North America, they're very familiar with the problem of the emerald ash borer, which is absolutely devastating ash woodlands um, throughout North America and is killing trees much, much faster than ash dieback kills them. And our fear, of course, is that we get emerald ash borer here in the UK as well. It's already found uh, around Moscow and could be spreading our way. And if that comes in as well, our ash populations will be absolutely devastated. So it's a tough time to be an ash tree. And it's also a good time to try to use genomics to improve our ash so that we can have resistance to ash dieback and also, if possible, the emerald ash borer as well. And of course, that wouldn't only benefit us and our fellow Europeans, but also uh, North America as well. So when ash dieback first came into the UK, I was working on the genomics of birch and thought, well, it would be good to start laying the foundations for genomic research on ash by sequencing the ash genome. And I applied to NERC for an urgency grant to do that. And they gave me about 65,000 to do a preliminary draft genome sequence for ash. And fortunately, at the time, I had two excellent PhD students who just started with me, funded by Marie Curie ITN, and they were at the stage in their project where I wasn't quite sure what they were going to do. And so they both got drafted in to work on uh, fraxinus genomics. And they've done an absolutely excellent job and will get a good PhD out of it. We chose to sequence a, this very uh, small and not particularly impressive looking tree growing at the Earth Trust in Oxfordshire because it's the product of a self-pollination. This was um, done in a European-funded experiment about 10 years ago on breeding systems in ash. And uh, David Boshier, who did the experiments, thought that he might as well hang on to the materials he generated just in case they came in useful at some point in the future. And thankfully they did. And so we were able to sequence a genome that had very low heterozygosity. And that made our assembly of the genome much, much simpler than it would have been otherwise. So I spent all of the money from NERC on um, sequencing. Um, half the money went on Illumina sequencing and half on 454 sequencing. With hindsight, I'd have probably changed um, the spread of how I spent the money, but this has yielded us a really good uh, preliminary genome sequence. 
and we have an N50 of just under 100 kilobase pairs. That means that half of the genome sequence is present in fragments which are over um, 100,000 DNA letters long, which is very respectable for a de novo gen genome sequencing project. And what we're particularly happy about here is that the total size of the scaffolds of this assembly, 875 megabase pairs, is almost exactly the same as the genome size we've measured for ASH using flow cytometry. So we think we've got a really um, good genome sequence here. 20% is still in ends, and that's probably uh, repeats. And um, we've actually gone back to look at repetitive elements in our raw reads, and about 35% of the genome is repeats, as I'll show you in a moment. And we've made all the data available as we've got it um, at this website so that other people working on um, ASH dieback can use our data. And uh, Ian Bancroft at York has been using this for work on association transcriptomics, where he's trying to find candidate genes for uh, low susceptibility to ASH dieback. Uh, we also did some transcriptome sequencing um, from the leaves of the small tree that we sequenced the genome of, and also from its mother, we went and collected flower tissue. Um, and that's enabled us to annotate the uh, coding regions of the genome um, very well. Uh, so as I say, 35% of the genome is repeats, as you'd expect in an angiosperm. And um, here's the various different um, classes of retrotransposons and other transposons and repetitive elements that we find, all fairly standard stuff. So then we wanted to um, try to start looking for genes for uh, low susceptibility to ash dieback. And fortunately, at uh, TGAC in Norwich, they had begun to sequence the genome of tree 35 which is a clone of ash from Denmark, which seems to have very low susceptibility to ash dieback. It's not completely resistant by any means, but it has much lower susceptibility than most wild ash trees. So they had a draft assembly of that genome, which we can start to compare with our uh, genome. And we've also worked with them to do some additional sequencing and to improve our annotation of the tree that we sequence, because they have a very well-established pipeline at TJAC to do that. And so using their pipeline, we found um, that we had roughly 43,000 genes in the genome, which is roughly what you'd expect from an angiosperm of this type. And they produce 59,000 different transcripts among them. And so that's annotated. And that's now available on the web um, as well. With them, we decided to also start sequencing ash trees from all over Europe so we could begin to build up a picture of diversity in the ash genome across its range. And um, we used a provenance trial that's also at the Earth Trust uh, near Oxford, where 15 years ago or so, under a project called Realising Ash's Potential, funded by the EU, um, a set of populations were sampled all over Europe and um, placed in a large reciprocal transplant or provenance trial um, with locations in various countries, including the UK. So um, I was able just to walk down their rows and sample plants from all over Europe in one afternoon, which is the simplest field trip I've ever done in my life. And so we've started to sequence them. We're sequencing them at low coverage, and we're now assembling that data and analysing the SNPs. And we're finding quite high SNP diversity across Europe. So we'll have a diversity panel. If we need to, we can design um, arrays to look at SNPs in many other trees, if needs be. Now, to also search for genes for resistance to ash dieback and also to the emerald ash borer, we decided to start looking genus-wide. This was for a couple of reasons. One was that it could be that the sufficient diversity is simply not available in Fraxinus excelsior, the European ash. Um, for us to breed for low susceptibility to ash dieback or the emerald ash borer. And the other intriguing thing um, about um, the genus Fraxinus is that various preliminary reports suggest that various species have resistance or low susceptibility to ash dieback and to the emerald ash borer. And that's particularly true of Asiatic species because it seems that both of these problems have actually come from East Asia.
So the Asiatic species have had a long history of co-evolution with this, this pest and pathogen. And we want to look at their genomes to see if they have particular genes within them that are conferring low susceptibility. And so these, um, the leaves that you can see there on the right in this diagram are trying to show um, where um, resistant trees occur. They're shown by a, a green leaf, whereas susceptible trees are shown by a, a brown leaf. So very incomplete data so far, but um, intriguing evidence for convergent evolution of resistance or low susceptibility to these problems in the genus Fraxinus. And we want to use that convergence to try and find these genes. So our plan is, and this is funded by the Living with Environmental Change uh, project with, with various funders who I'll acknowledge at the end. Our idea is to sequence the genome of every species in the genus and then build a gene tree, a gene phylogeny for every gene in the genome and look for those genes that have a phy phylogeny which has a topology that fits with the distribution of low susceptibility to emerald ash borer or ash dieback in the genus. And if we find a gene where there's a little clade where all of the resistant species cluster together, that is a good candidate gene for uh, resistance or low susceptibility to the problem. So, uh, as, so at Queen Mary, we're sequencing the genome of each species. And uh, at Forest Research, at their northern research station in Roslyn, Steve Lee is leading uh, the grafting of various different ash species from UK living collections that will be planted out into areas that have ash dieback and so that we can screen every species that we can get hold of in the genus for susceptibility to ash dieback. And that's now well underway. And you can just see some of the variation in leaves um, in the... Um, plants that he's grafted up so far. In collaboration with the US Forest Service in uh, Ohio, Jennifer Cook's group, who is here on the right, um, we are doing assays similar to what we're doing on ash dieback for every species of ash that we can get hold of in US living collections. And uh, we are inoculating them with eggs of the emerald ash borer and seeing what happens um, to the larvae. Um, some species can actually kill the larvae and some can't. Um, Fraxinus manchurica um, from East Asia is particularly good at killing the larvae. And so we're rolling out these experiments for every species that we can get hold of, um, of Fraxinus. Um, so, so far, we don't have a complete collection in our trials, partly because one clade, Porciflora, is very hard to get hold of. It's a shrubby clade from Mexico in the south of the USA. So we're struggling to get that one, but it probably won't be very relevant for UK um, timber growing anyway. So uh, we're not too troubled by that. And of course, we have the problem that we can't exchange material between our American experiments and our British experiments because we don't want to risk moving either problem between countries. So we're a bit limited in what we can do, but we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. And um, so far, we've sent off um, several species for genome sequencing, and we're just extracting the DNA from the others uh, to send that off as well. So just to, to conclude, I think that in general, there's huge potential um, for tree genomics to enhance tree breeding. We, we haven't done much tree breeding in the past, and if you think that this morning we were hearing about reducing the um, time span of breeding a new wheat variety from 10 years to 7 years, and what a gain that would be, well, if we can start doing marker-assisted breeding or genomic selection in trees, we could potentially be reducing um, the number of years involved in breeding a tree variety by a much bigger percentage than that, because in something like ash, we're waiting about 12 years uh, before we can start breeding from them. And obviously, you need a huge amount of space to grow large numbers of ash trees. But if we can use genomic technologies to find trees at the seedling stage that we can select for growing on and phenotyping, then the, the, the savings are, are much, much bigger than the savings that we can potentially see in arable crops. So I think there's a, a lot to be excited about there for forestry. And we're hoping that our work on ash using a phylogenomic approach to find candidate genes um, 
will hopefully demonstrate a new way of finding candidate genes for traits that can work on forest trees without going through an initial uh, breeding cycle or looking at a, a cross to find them. This has been a highly collaborative effort. Um, my postdoc Laura Kelly and my PhD student Lizzie Solars have been absolutely key to this and have done a great deal of the work. And um, Yasmin Zorin and Will Crowther at QMUL in my group as well. Um, at TJAC, a large number of people have been involved in the ash genomic work there. And the ELWEC project on uh, genus-wide diversity is a collaboration between forest research, the US Forest Service, uh, Penn State are a bit involved in providing some of the DNA. And at Oxford, uh, someone in the geography department called Paul Jepson is doing a sociological study of public attitudes to different genetic solutions to tree health issues because we obviously don't want to go through decades of research to produce a tree that's resistant to ash dieback and the emerald ash borer that people don't want to see planted out into the British landscape. So we're asking, are people happy with hybrid trees? Would they be happy with an alien tree from China growing if it didn't look much different to a UK ash tree? What would people think about a genetically modified tree? You know, we, we know people don't seem to want to eat genetically modified food maybe, but if this bench was made of genetically modified wood, would, would that bother me doing a talk from it? Uh, maybe not. So that's the kind of question we think we need to ask the public before we get too far down the line in uh, what we do about this issue. And, and various other collaborators too uh, that you can see on the slide. So thank you very much. <laughs>